My name is Abhijit Singh, and this lecture is going to be about how to design, analyze, and interpret uh, test scores in the specific context of learning evaluations, uh, of impact evaluations in particular. And the background is that there's a lot of both research and policy attention towards the learning crisis, the fact that lots of students who are enrolled in schools don't seem to be learning very much in education systems in many low and middle income countries. And this is one of the major development challenges that faces these systems in the 21st century. There is an increasingly large uh, and growing evidence base that looks at what different interventions uh, can help us do in solving this problem. So for instance, things like remedial instruction, things like school inputs, things like uh, different accountability measures. And there are many large surveys of this literature. Typically, all of these studies use research administered tests in developing countries. And that's actually something that sets them quite far apart from similar work in, say, the US or various European countries. My focus in this lecture is what are the key principles that we have for designing these tests? If it turns out that you're going to do an impact evaluation and you are designing uh, test measures that are go going to be used as the core outcome metric, what are the kind of things that you need to keep in mind? And if you're an analyst who's looking at data like that, that were collected by somebody else, well, what are things that you need to keep in mind for the analysis and for interpreting effect sizes in ways that relates back to how the test was measured and what it was focused on? Primarily, I'm going to be talking, since, we, uh, since we're in the context of the learning crisis in low and middle income countries, that I'm going to be talking about tests of math and uh, language, which are, the which are the domains in which most of uh, these studies have focus. They're going to be typically researcher administered independently proctored tests. So I'm not going to worry about, uh, say, cheating or other versions of manipulation here. And I'm going to be thinking specifically about uh, primary and middle schools, right? So uh, just reflecting goals of universal literacy and numeracy, uh, that these are uh, really about foundational skills. Now, that's not the only set of interesting outcomes uh, to be looked at, uh, but for instance, looking at how to measure post-secondary outcomes or uh, how to measure socio-emotional skills have very distinct measurement challenges. Okay, so this is going to be about math and language in elementary schooling. Since these are the core outcome variables for studies like this, clearly measuring them well is absolutely central to study design. And the things that I want to cover today are, well, in this scenario, which is a very common scenario and maybe the dominant scenario in the economics of education literature in this respect, uh, what are our objectives in test design? And how do we score these tests? Uh, what does that mean about uh, how we should administer them? What booklets should look like? How do we analyze the data that comes from these afterwards and just some practical issues? So the first step, right? I mean, what does a good test look like? And it helps to discuss this beforehand because it determines what are the kind of items you need uh, and, and what is the general length that you should be going for. So the first set of concerns that are incredibly important relate to content validity. And so a test is useful only if it's measuring the right things. And the right things will vary depending on context, uh, both the setting in which this is being administered, the age of the kids, but also the problem at hand. Right? So the first is, you know, this appropriate to uh, a geographical and cultural context, that questions that you ask make sense to the populations that you're asking them. And that means that there's going to be a major need for piloting, for adapting instruments, making sure uh, that questions actually measure what you think it measures. One important uh, thing there is that, you know, we typically want to measure, can children do specific things? Uh, so do they have specific knowledge? And what we don't want to measure is, well, uh, can they take tests well? Uh, is this really an assessment of what they know or just their ability to get things done very, very quickly, right? And then the last bit, which is particularly important for uh, impact evaluations is that you have an intervention in mind. 
And it's something that you have to pay a lot of attention to in trying to think through, is this a domain that can be shifted by my intervention or not? So for instance, if you are, uh, if you are uh, looking at something that improves the ability to just read and write fluently, trying to, uh, trying to measure things that are about, say, background knowledge in science is not going to show you an effect, even if there was one. At the same time, data on other domains can be useful for understanding dimensions that were affected indirectly. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that your test always has some items and some areas that would clearly be directly affected. And if you have the space to also have some other areas that could potentially be uh, indirectly affected because, for instance, the intervention crowded out the time or effort being spent in other areas of education that are important. Take a concrete example, let's say you put in a performance-based payment uh, kind of intervention that rewards students for their scores in math. You want to measure math scores in, uh, in the way that like the outcome metric would look at, but you also want to ideally measure performance in other subjects because did the students actually learn more overall or did they just substitute away time that they would have, for instance, spent on English and change it towards math. That also relates to issues of, you know, thinking through how the assessment might be gamed. And by gamed, I mean specifically that, for instance, in certain uh, types of, say, accountability interventions, is it a concern in this context that teachers may teach to the test? If that is, then what are the kind of items that you can put in that see whether genuine knowledge of the kind that would be hard for teachers to have directly coached on changed or not? So when I say content validity, there isn't really a hard and fast rule about what makes a test valid, but it requires very deep engagement with both the specific cultural and geographic context of the settings you're administering it to, uh, so the population you're administering it to, the age of the children, but also about the intervention that you hope to learn about. The second is a bit trickier, which is about distribution and discrimination. So ideally, what you really want is the test should give you a continuous, well-distributed measure of student achievement. This is useful for a number of statistical purposes, but also intuitively. There is always otherwise the risk that you get ceiling of floor effects, which is, uh, which is to say that you get a truncated measure of student ability. You know that the student can't do question X. You don't know what they actually can do. And this is something that ends up being uh, very common if in settings where children are several years behind grade level, you only end up, for instance, administering a test that looks at their textbook uh, and similar exam questions of the grade they're enrolled in. The opposite happens if the test is too easy, where, where most students are getting 100% right. Well, you know at most that some students benefited, but you don't actually, you can't actually estimate the full extent of what they may have learned. So in order to be able to assess uh, effect size as well, you want a test that doesn't have ceiling of floor effects, and that means that the test shouldn't be too easy, too hard, or too short. Uh, this turns out often to be very hard to achieve, especially if you think of, uh, say, at the primary school level, things like, say, the Assar test, or uh, say some EGRA test, can you uh, recognize a letter? Well, all that, uh, can you recognize a letter? Can you recognize a word? Uh, can you read a sentence? If that's all you measure, that's all that you can really talk about effect sizes on. Whereas depending on the type of intervention, you may want to care about uh, slightly higher order competences around can you make sense of information from a passage, uh, receptive vocabulary and the like. Test should also be discriminating, which is that ideally you want to be able to tell, uh, that you want the test to be sensitive to actual ability levels, not just at the median, but also towards the tails. Okay, and these are related things, but that's what we're going for. The third bit 
is about comparability and benchmarking, which is that two different assessments, even when they're measuring the same construct, aren't comparable unless they're designed to be. So one, one thing that we'll talk about a bit more uh, in a few minutes is that a one standard deviation effect is not the same thing across different contexts, across tests of different design or across different scoring methods. And ideally, what is the kind of comparability that we want uh, to have at the back of our minds? Well, one is that you want some version of dynamic complementarity. So a lot of uh, studies are longitudinal, so they're following the same kids over time. And you ideally want to be able to pick up learning over time for the same children. So you want test measures to be comparable over different rounds. You want them, ideally, uh, you want the results of your study to be comparable to other studies in this context. So that's cross-section comparability. And frequently, our studies are not run in representative samples. So you really want to benchmark this to international distribution. So this particular sample, what do they look like in comparison to the national test score distribution, to TIMS, to PISA, and so on. Uh, and that's very useful to be able to uh, build in as well. What does this mean in terms of actual uh, choices that face us at the stage of test design? Well, one is that it, uh, it really influences what are the test items you're going to have. By items, I mean what are the questions that you're including in order uh, to actually collect measures of student achievement on. So tests need to contain items that target a very wide distribution of achievement, right? So especially if you only measure things that are in the textbook or things that were taught this year, if students are really far behind, it is possible that your intervention was effective it raised, uh, it raised achievement levels quite substantially, but you don't pick it up on tests because you're not measuring easier skills. And that's where uh, the uh, primary learning has been. You know, and each item needs to map to a concrete skill, uh, skill that we want to test. Why does this matter? This matters because as we discussed earlier, you want to think through what are the kind of things that could be changed by this particular intervention. If it's uh, say an intervention that uh, sends stories uh, on the phone uh, to various uh, parents, which they're meant to read out. Well, does it change receptive vocabulary? Is very different from uh, does it change uh, the ability to read on your own? So that's why you need an item map at the very beginning. This is something that maps each question to the competence that it tests and uh, what, if anything, this can be compared to. You want a subset of the same items across rounds for comparability, right? So the easiest way of comparing is where students answer at least partly the same questions. You typically don't want the entire test to be repeated again and again with the same population. And that's largely because not, uh, so tests are typically designed to be uh, appropriate for particular ages and as children age, you would want to include some harder items to capture new learning, but also that uh, they could just generally be learning effects, right? But, uh, because I've seen this question before, I have now learned how to answer exactly this question. So you want some new items always coming in. Ideally, you want a subset of items to be drawn from other assessments as well. And that's for comparability across tests. Now, this has uh, several other uh, aspects that go in, but in, to, uh, to provide the basic idea, uh, uh, so in, in general terms, essentially if somebody else ran uh, a, a representative survey and you see, well, 85% of students could answer two times two equals what, and 60% do in your sample uh, at baseline, then you know that yours is a more disadvantaged sample, or at least a lower scoring sample. Right? So to, uh, to allow for some comparability across tests. There are issues about choosing how to administer the test. So we said that we want to continuously distribute and measure of achievement. Whether you get this or not will depend on how you're choosing to administer this. And by, by this, I specifically mean how you are eliciting responses to individual test questions. So there are at least three uh, ways uh, that are incredibly common. Uh, one is where an interviewer individually asks each question to a child. And this is, for instance, very common with uh, things like 
Edgar the early grade rating assessment or uh, the ASAR assessments uh, in various citizen-led uh, tests uh, in India, in Pakistan, in various other places in East Africa. Uh, there is what's called group oral administration, which tries to, uh, which, which provides a group of students, say, uh, imagine a classroom, uh, and it provides them an answer sheet, but an individual enumerator stands and reads out the question, and students have to mark exactly uh, which is the correct response. And then the last is probably the one that we're most familiar with, which is written administration. Right? So there is a question paper, there's an answer script, and students uh, respond. They read the questions, they answer them, they choose the right answers. Uh, there are clear advantages and disadvantages to all of these, especially at really young grades or in populations where uh, reading levels are generally just very low. Individual oral is probably uh, the most reliable way of ensuring that you don't end up getting floral. By floor effects, I mean lots of students just uh, score a zero. It's very burdensome in the field with, uh, because one, in, one surveyor needs to go and ask this to each child separately. Group oral tries to solve uh, exactly this issue that many students can't read. And it tries to do this at scale by having one interviewer read it out to a large group of students. But depending on the ages, just managing groups of students together is uh, can, or can be quite difficult and you can get less precise answers. Written tests end up being completely ideal for later grades, so in middle school and secondary school and the like. The problem is that in primary school you frequently end up getting a number of students scoring a zero, not because they didn't necessarily know uh, the answer to the question you wanted to ask. Let's say it was an arithmetic question and you wanted to ask something very specific. It might be that they knew how to solve a particular question. They just did not know how to read the entire uh, prompt before. The balancing across these, uh, these types of administration is strongly influenced by field work and logistics. Uh, in principle, a lot of these can now also be done uh, using digital assessments. But those are still relatively nascent in this uh, in this space, so we're not going to be discussing those at the moment. The second, the second set of uh, decisions that I think we need to think about quite carefully is how do we create an aggregate test score? And this is one of those areas that's uh, underappreciated in how different uh, your results can be depending on how you do this. The basic problem is the following. A test fundamentally uh, is a collection of one individual's responses to a sequence of items. Whereas what we typically want when we're looking at effects uh, is an aggregate test metric, right? Something that says this child's math score was X. And there are at least four common ways that we see uh, measures of student achievement reported. One is you know, just seeing a binary or a categorical uh, variable. So let's imagine that this is an official uh, exam and all you record is whether the child passed or not. It could be a categorical variable, so you could see pass, fail, distinction. Uh, or, for instance, in basic reading assessments, you could say, well, recognizes a letter, recognizes a word, recognize, can read a sentence, uh, can read a paragraph. And there, everyone's binned into uh, one of these four or can read nothing, right? So you can get categories in this way. Sometimes you would just see a raw percentage correct. The student answered X percent uh, of the exam correctly. You can, in impact evaluations, uh, what is much more common is to see things reported in internally normalized standard deviations. So based on uh, the, the distribution of test scores in the baseline or in the control group that, you know, there is an X standard deviation increment uh, in learning or, or so. And then sometimes you can see uh, item response uh, theory uh, scores. These, these confusingly are also typically in standard deviations, but instead of just having summed up responses, 
across the different questions, what they do is they actually fit a statistical model that we'll talk a little bit more about. Uh, so, uh, this last one is probably the most desirable, but it needs much more prep work before and much more analysis after. What does item response theory do? Well, the basic idea is that it models the probability that an individual with a given ability will actually answer a test question correctly. And keeping fixed the characteristics of particular test questions, what it means is that you know I can look at what are the sets of questions that you answered in order to generate a score for you. We're not going to go into the full statistics of this, but one thing that it uh, allows allows us to do is that you can put two tests on a common scale if they just had some items in common. And that's going to be very important, especially as you try and design tests that are comparable over time, even as the children age. There are also uh, other advantages to it, that there are better diagnostics for cross-sample comparisons. You can put up adaptive tests and the like. And it's less arbitrary than just adding up the number of correct responses. So this is completely common in the education measurement psychometrics uh, literature. And if you've ever taken the GRE or the SAT uh, or used like TIMS or PISA data, this is how those tests are scored. Analyzing data. So a few different things to keep in mind. I think the first and most important thing and frequently neglected is just doing due diligence on does the test metric make sense? And what do I mean by make sense? Are they well distributed? If they're not, then how sensitive would your metric be to uh, issues around measurement, the fact that it's not sensitive to, a, say, the bottom end or the top end? If you're measuring the same kids over time and you think this is a comparable test, are you seeing some increases over time? Because those tend to happen just as students age, even uh, independent of what they're learning in school. Are there sensible interpreted correlations? Learning ends up being a cumulative process. Students who do well in this period are also typically more likely to do well in levels in the next period. Are there sensible intersubject correlations? Students who typically do well in one subject do well in other ones as well. Uh, are there sensible correlations with wealth, with parental education? Unfortunately, in nearly all societies, we see an SES gradient. All of this is to say, does the test metric make sense both internally and uh, and with respect to external observations? Okay. Uh, this is kind of like a sniff test for your test metric. If it smells fishy, it doesn't have to mean any, none of these uh, things individually need to mean that the test is unreliable or wasn't administered properly, but it means that you definitely do need to dig deeper to understand what is happening. It also just highlights the importance of piloting and validating your test before a logic of full survey. So these are things that you should check with your pilot data before you decide on uh, what is your final assessment. The second part is how do we make sense of magnitudes? Let's say I run intervention A and intervention B and I do this in uh, separate samples and I report to you effect sizes in standard deviations. Well, what does the standard deviation impact mean? And I think this is underappreciated, but by itself, without knowing much more about the context, the test, the distribution, uh, very little. So in a normal distribution, this would roughly uh, be the move from the median to the 66 percentile. But we don't actually know whether the test score distribution in most papers in baseline is anywhere close to normal. Right? So I mean, if you have a lot of kids scoring zero, you could have very large standard deviation effects that actually uh, mean relatively little in terms of how much better they got on individual uh, individual competencies. There's some suggestions that you know maybe we should convert uh, standard deviations to learning adjusted years of schooling, uh, and the idea there is basically express in multiples of the change over time in the control group. That helps and it's worth doing, but it's also quite tricky because the change in the control group is also completely test dependent and sample dependent, right? So it's not clear that you're, that even if you had a great test that the change over time 
in the control group in your study approximates in any way uh, the change in business and usual in the population overall because most study populations are not representative of the uh, full population in the country or in the grade. Uh, there are issues that arise from the fact that test scores are ordinal. Uh, they provide you a rank ordering, but it's a typical test score can't be interpreted in the way that a test score of 10 means it's twice the test score of 5. One thing that is useful to do is to actually just report the increase in probability of actually answering certain sets of questions. So if you want to compare them and say they're in similar populations, uh, just seeing this is how much more likely it made uh, students to be able to do a multiplication question properly, a uh, division question properly, etc. cetera. Uh, there's trade-offs in aggregation, but at least it's clear what you actually achieved. There's issues about distributions and heterogeneity. Now, wherever possible, and this is a lesson that goes sort of beyond test scores, it's worth reporting treatment effects across the full distribution. And by that, I mean two sets of things. One is by baseline uh, levels of achievement, right? So for students who are initially uh, high performing and for students who are initially low performing, is it that the test score uh, effects differ? And that's very informative in lots of different settings. The other is to just see that the whole distribution of test scores in the end line, does that look different across treated and controlled groups? So, this is what you might hear of is called uh, quantile treatment effects. You, you also want to report at least some basic measures of heterogeneity across gender and across socioeconomic characteristics. So, so frequently done, say, with the wealth index. One underappreciated set of things about this is don't turn uh, just showing heterogeneity into a fishing expedition, right? So. Analysis are typically underpowered for detecting heterogeneity, and uh, you need to make sure that the difference across groups is actually uh, statistically significant and not just the result of like testing for multiple hypotheses. Some, uh, so in the last couple of minutes, like just a couple of examples of the kind of analyses that I found useful uh, in the past. So here is a graph from uh, a paper uh, that I did recently. Uh, this is using Young Lives data uh, in four countries, Ethiopia, India, Peru, and Vietnam. And this is the cumulative uh, distribution function, the CDF, the empirical CDF, in each of the countries. Right? So it tells you that what proportion of uh, the population uh, scores at any particular level. So these are IIT scores. And I think what is important to see here is that, let's say Vietnam, it's just significantly to the right of everywhere else. Why does this matter? This matters because even if test scores are ordinal, uh, any, any change here, it doesn't matter whether we're looking at the 20th percentile, the 40th percentile, the 60th percentile, at all levels, the equivalent percentile in Vietnam, the equivalent child in Vietnam, is just doing a lot better than uh, in this sample, say the child in India or the child in Ethiopia. And that's, that's important because you can have distributions where maybe the bottom 20% of kids do better in one system and the other 80% do better in the other. And that's important to know as well. In the same paper, and this is what I mean by wanting to study whether uh, whether certain effects differ across students at different levels of education, uh, different levels of initial achievement. You know what this is looking at is well, on a test of quantitative reasoning that kids took at five, what do we expect this course to be at the age of eight? And what you can see again is at any level of uh, initial achievement, you see test scores being a lot higher in India than in Ethiopia, a bit higher in Peru than in India, and for Vietnam being substantially higher. Right, So it tells us that there's something happening in this education system that's just moving the entire distribution, conditional on you know, what level of achievement at five was, 
So it's moving that entire distribution uh, one step further. And similarly, here is uh, an example from uh, an impact evaluation in RCT that I did with uh, Karthik Murlidharan and uh, Alejandro Kanimian. And what we're looking at here is, you know, what is the percentile that you had in the baseline test in the full population, and then what the endline score is. And you can see that essentially at all levels of ability, the treatment group is shifted up from the control group, which is to say that the difference between these two lines is the treatment effect, and you can see it's kind of similar across the board. So that's actually very useful to be able to see. And one message is that, you know, as far as possible, graphical analyses actually complement uh, uh, analysis and tables uh, and out of regression output quite a bit. And, and finally, you know, what does that shift up mean? Uh, so in the sample overall, we see effects of about 0.22 of a standard deviation in math. What does that actually mean? And here we can see that, you know, something like, say 66% of students in the control group would answer these uh, questions on arithmetic computation, that goes up by about eight percentage points in the treated group, right? So the percentage correct in this uh, competence goes up by about eight percentage points. Uh, it does in word problems. It goes up by about four percentage points from a base of about 38% in data interpretations and so on. Right? So that it's possible to look at the table and say, what did kids actually learn? Uh, and, and this is something that I actually recommend that you do more broadly. 